Jennifer, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, excellent, thanks. Okay, I think it's fixed, thank you so much. You got it. All right, so we're gonna start with bro science, okay? I ask this every semester, I think I know the answer, but, okay? How many of you have ever been to a workout class of some sort? Put your hand up. Almost everyone. Okay. How many of you, as part of that workout class, have done some sort of abdominal exercise, or maybe, maybe you've gone to an exercise class where that's all that you do? 45 minutes of crunches and planks and, I don't know, mountain climbers and what other 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 terrible things that we do. Anybody ever done that? A couple of y'all. We don't teach that class anymore. But when I was at Ole Miss, that was like the most popular like activity class was a thing that was like abs class. That's all that it was. 45 minutes of abs. Okay. So those of you that have done abdominal exercise, I'm not going to ask you to share your own particular reason for having done this. Okay, but the vast majority of people that do abdominal exercises do it for, we'll say one of two reasons, the primary of which is I want abdominal muscles that people can see, right? I want to look like I have like a six pack of abs, right? We're, you know, you guys don't get spring break this year. See that normal spring is all off. So normally I would say, if you're going to go to the beach over spring break, you better start training and dieting right now. Don't wait till the week before. But you're not doing that. Now. But people think if I do some kind of abdominal exercise, I will have more pronounced appearing abdominal muscles. Maybe I will lose subcutaneous body fat around those abdominal muscles. And they will look, right? I will look like Rick told you. That's why they're going to do that, okay? Now, a secondary reason may be I want core strength, I need to balance out, right, for my low back to help my posture. There's other reasons for doing all of these things, but one of the primary bro-ish, I need to be very careful with this, okay? Ladies, y'all can also be bros, okay? Bro is just a way of kind of somewhat uh, only informed by popular magazines and, and kind of whatever I've seen on Instagram or something now by these things. If I do abdominal exercise, it will help me lose fat and give me a six pack, okay? I'm not gonna, no, you have to put your hands up or anything else, but if you've done this, think about if this describes you, okay? Think about if you've ever done sit-ups or crunches or planks or something else in the thought of, that's what I'm getting right here, I'm working on it. Okay, so on another day, we'll talk about why would you train your abs? You'd never go to a whole class and just bench press, right? Although it is Monday, and if you guys want something fun to do, go over to the Huff today at about 3 o'clock and watch the bros bench press. It's Monday. They will all be bench pressing today. I promise you, okay? It's chest day. But... You'd never go and bench for 45 minutes. You'd never go and just do curls for 45 minutes, would you? But you'll do it for your abs. That's some strength. We'll come back to it on a different day. Okay? So here is um, a research study where they looked at the effect of abdominal exercise on abdominal fat. Okay? This is not the longest study. It's not the most sophisticated study, but it's an, a reasonable illustration of what we're talking about. Okay? So they had um, people that did, uh, 10 people that did nothing and 14 people that did six weeks of abdominal exercise, okay? Planks, crunches, sit-ups, normal kind of things. What you can see, here they are beforehand, here they are after that six weeks of time. And they took their body weight, they looked at something called their body mass index, which we will talk a whole lot about. BMI is basically how much do you weigh based upon how tall you are, kind of an estimate of how much space you occupy. Not at all a measure of anything to do with body composition. Okay? They looked at their total body fat, 
and the whole body and what they're calling android fat, which is basically here, okay, around their abdominal region. And so you can see here are the values for control and exercise. Here's their values in control and exercise after having done things. And you will note that if you squint really, really hard, they went from about 36% down to about 35% total body fat from about a little over 43 down to a little over 42%. These are not statistically different. Um, what that tells us is that this is probably within the margin of error of our measurement tools. And the take home is that six weeks of exercise, abdominal and exclusive exercise, had absolutely no effect whatsoever on the amount of body fat that they had here, either total body or specifically in their abdominal region, okay? So, what conclusion should we draw from all of this? Anybody? More than one specific, I'm sorry? Okay. More than one specific body part I have to focus on. So if I want abs, I need to do squats. If I want to have abs, I need to, I don't know, do shoulder press or curls? Is that what you were meaning or? Mm. Okay, sure. Okay. You guys ever heard of something? Yes. Okay. Not one exercise that fits every single goal. That's very reasonable. Um, working out your abs will help keep your abs. You like them in the diet. Okay. You guys have all said things that are very much true to kind of certain degree. So what I would tell you is, if you want abs, no Chick-fil-A. If you want abs, no McDonald's. No pizza. You can't go to couch and eat. I'm sorry. If you want abs, you have to lose weight. We lose weight everywhere, okay? You cannot do some kind of exercise and lose weight or lose fat only in one specific area. It's an idea called spot reduction. My mom does this, right? And she thinks if I do some tricep kickbacks, is my flabby tricep gonna go away? She's been doing that for 25 years and her flabby tricep is still there, okay? Now tell her that. It's okay, you all will have them too one day. Okay. I used to think, no, not me. And I'm like, yes, it, it happens. Age comes for us all. Okay. When we lose weight, much like when we gain weight, we tend to gain it everywhere and lose it everywhere. Now, every person individually is going to store fat in slightly different areas. There tend to be uh, sex differences in that and then some other individualized differences on those things. But in general, okay. When I lose weight, I will lose it everywhere. When I lose body fat, I lose it everywhere. And so, how do we lose weight? If I want abs, why am I telling you not to go to Chick-fil-A? I want Chick-fil-A. Right? You have to be in a caloric deficit. We'll talk about that later. We can do some other diet stuff. But if you want to lose body fat, you have to eat less than what your body needs every day in order to lose weight, okay? You will also lose some muscle when you do all of that, but that's the key thing. What you guys actually need, the number of calories is really not that much in comparison. So you go and you have a Chick-fil-A sandwich and some french fries and a milkshake and you've had two days worth of calories, okay? So, so there we go, all right? So the myth of all of this is not that abs class is bad or that abdominal exercises are bad for you. They're not, okay? It's just that doing those is not necessarily going to help you achieve that one goal from an appearance standpoint. We do abdominal exercises. You're going to strengthen those muscles, right? You're going to get better at contracting them that number of times in that particular manner, which may have its own benefits. They're going to be very positive, but it's not going to do the other thing that a lot of lay people think it's going to. And that is the essence of bro science, okay? That's the essence. It sounds like, yeah, I'm gonna do this and it, it should work. It's a little more complicated. Though. There's a little more nuance to all of this. Stuff. 
and I want you guys to be able to kind of work through that. Okay. Tiny, tiny fraction of actual material for today. We'll do about 15 minutes, and then we'll call it quits. Okay. Most days we'll stop somewhere between 12:30 and about 12:45. We won't go all the way up to the end. Okay. So. I like to start class by talking about what is health and what is fitness. Okay? They are in the title of the course. Obviously, because of that, they must be very, very important. And they are. Okay? So there's lots of ways to think about health. Okay? So if we look via something called the World Health Organization, which the United States just rejoined last week. Um, this is a definition from about 1950. They define health as a state of complete physical, mental, social, okay, well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So being healthy is multidimensional, and it doesn't specifically just mean that you are currently not sick, okay? There's a whole wide range of things. It's not just this very simple, I don't have the flu or a cold right now, so I'm healthy. Okay? And it has multiple dimensions, a physical dimension, a mental dimension, a social dimension. Right? So there's lots of things that go into making us healthy. Right? I want you guys to think of health as a continuum. It exists from positive to negative. Okay? And we can have a positive to negative on every dimension. And if I ask you a specific question and I say, where are you right now between absolute peak perfect physical health and basically like dead physical health over here, all of you are going to be somewhere on that continuum in between those two places. Does that make sense? Some nods of head, maybe, yes. I'm getting better at reading people's eyes from having all the masks on, but I sometimes get a little bit more, okay? Same thing for mental health, social health, those kinds of things. This idea of positive on one side, negative on the other, and some midpoint where you're pretty neutral with those things, okay? All right. So if that's what health is, we need to understand what are the things that are going to cause us to not have sort of perfect, high-end, positive health, okay? We call anything that moves us away from, okay, the kind of positive state of physical, psychological, or social well-being that does not kill us, those are called morbidities, okay? It's called a morbidity. If we look at, okay, for instance, if you go to the Oklahoma... COVID webpage, you want to look at where you're going to fall in line for when you can get a vaccine. I hate to break it to you guys. Y'all are on the, y'all are going to be like the last people to get one. Okay. But if you look on the, on the top part, it is people over a certain age and people with what they're going to call, they don't call them comorbid conditions, but they would call them high risk conditions. Okay. Those things that make a person high risk and move them up to get the COVID vaccine are what we call comorbidities, okay? Something that moves them and puts them at a greater risk of not having positive health outcomes, okay? So if you have high blood pressure, that's a morbidity. If you have a cold, that's a morbidity. If you have cancer, that's a morbidity, okay? If you are like me and you have an anxiety disorder, that's a morbidity. You have depressive symptoms, morbidity. Okay? You broke your leg, morbidity. Okay? Anything that's going to push us away from positive is considered a morbidity. So what we're going to do a lot of times in class, especially in the last, say, six weeks, is we're going to take individual morbidities things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, okay? We're going to take those and talk about how if we exercise, we become more fit, if we become more active, if we change our cardiovascular function or our muscle function, 
we are going to talk about how we can use exercise to counteract a lot of these morbidities and push us from negative or neutral over more into the positive side, both from a physical and a mental, less so from a social, but we, well, that's kind of for a different class. But really for these two things, we'll talk about how we can use exercise applied to different kinds of morbidities to help us out, okay? When people talk about morbidities, we often talk about them from something that we would call either prevalence or incidence. Right, so you may see things that will say one out of every 50 people in Oklahoma has had a stroke, okay? That would be what we would call, that's the prevalence of something. So we're expressing, right, the number of people that have a particular morbidity or have been ill from something per some population. So we have the entire population of Oklahoma. We figure out the number of people that have had a stroke we divide that by the total population and reduce our fraction there and it gives us some kind of a ratio okay for a percentage right five percent of people on campus have had covid right half a percentage of people that have covid have died something like that so we, we can calculate those same kinds of things for all of our mobility okay for anything that it's going to be all right questions about that? Does that make sense to you guys? I'm going to use the word morbidity rather than disease a lot. And when I say something is comorbid, that means that it occurs with something else. Okay. You guys will see that most morbidities are going to have other things that occur with them. You're not just going to have one. You're going to have a cluster. Obesity is a morbidity. If you're obese and you're over the age of about 50, you probably also have cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes, okay? Those things are comorbid. And so that's what I mean when I say that. It occurs with something else. Okay. So most of the morbidities that we've mentioned are what we also call chronic diseases. Now, there is an entire class um, that we teach on chronic diseases. Okay. I used to teach it in the summer. I don't know if I'm going to teach it this summer, but we have a class on all of this. It's really fascinating. But chronic diseases are uh, things like cardiovascular disease, which is CVD, cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, arthritis, uh, multiple sclerosis, you name it. Things that are going to occur or persist for a prolonged or long duration of time. Okay. The first half of class, we're going to talk about anatomy physiology and exercise training and kind of responses to things in normal, healthy people. And in the back half of class, we're going to talk about applying that to these certain chronic diseases. The reason that we have to care about these chronic diseases is that about 60% of deaths worldwide, about two thirds of deaths in first world countries occur because of chronic diseases. Okay? Half of you in here will die from cancer or cardiovascular disease, okay? Half from those two things, all right? And so we need to understand them. We also need to understand the interaction of those with how physically active we are and how much we exercise and the interplay of those things, okay? They are on the rise worldwide for a host of reasons that are really kind of beyond the scope of class to talk about, but they are going. Okay. So here are the most common chronic diseases or the most common morbidities um, in the U.S. You guys can see that about almost 60% of the adult population in the U.S. has high blood pressure. Okay. It's a crazy number. We have Alzheimer's and some sort of dementia in about 40% of people. Um, I don't really know how they got their heart disease number because high blood pressure is considered heart disease. So. I don't know what their kind of what they mean exactly from all of this, but you can see depression, arthritis affect about a third of people. Osteoporosis affect, especially among women. If you assume that women are half of the population, and we're at about 30%, so that puts us at like 60% of women have osteoporosis. Diabetes, COPD, 
Uh, so that's a pulmonary condition here in the lungs, cancer, stroke, these kinds of things. So they're very, very common. Okay. These chronic diseases are typically the things that kill most people that are homicides and accidents. Okay. I will warn you guys now. Okay. When we talk about diseases, we're going to talk about decreases in mortality risk from exercise. So because of all of that, there will be days in class that we will talk about mortality. We will talk about death and dying a little bit and from certain conditions. I just want to warn everybody on the front end. Okay? It, it may be a little bit morbid some days, especially with COVID and rising death rates. You know, we all probably know someone that has passed away from cardiovascular disease or from cancer or something, and we will, we will talk about kind of the effects of exercise or activity or obesity or lack of exercise on the mortality rates from those, from those things. I just want to let you guys know. Okay. So if we look at right now the leading causes of death in men and in women, in our pie chart here, what I want you to appreciate is just what I told you guys, okay? About half of all deaths in men and slightly under half, about 45% or so in women, are from heart disease and cancer. So by heart disease, I mean heart attack, stroke, okay, something along those lines, congestive heart failure, or some form of cancer. Okay? And then we're going to look on kind of the other things are going to make up much, much smaller sort of pieces of all of this. Um, guys, we tend to die from unintentional injuries a lot more than the ladies do. You look at things like car accidents and motorcycle accidents and those things that tend to be much more prevalent in men um, for, a, for a host of reasons. Then we're going to put in here stroke and diabetes. You guys will see, right, diabetes accounts for about 3% of deaths. Um, by 20, 30, maybe another 10 years or so, like a third to 40% of the population adult population is going to be a type 2 diabetic if we don't reverse things. The diabetes doesn't kill you, right? You have diabetes and then you die from cardiovascular disease or from some forms of cancer that can be more prevalent in people that are sort of going to be obese or cancer. We'll talk about kind of how some of that stuff works out, okay? Again, I bring this up because you all probably need to care about this because it will affect people either in your life already that you care about, or it certainly will affect you and people you care about going forward. Okay. It gives me no pleasure to say that, but that's the honest truth. If we look at this, this is going to illustrate something about chronic diseases. Okay? If we look at causes of death by age, so here is the group that you guys would be in um, up to about 24 years of age. What you're going to see is that the most common kinds of uh, causes of death in what we're going to term relatively young adults um, down kind of all the way down to infants is going to be unintentional injuries, suicide, and homicide are going to account for about two-thirds of them. Okay? Very, very few deaths from cancer, very few from heart disease, okay? Not a lot that's going on with those two things. You get into my age range, so kind of middle young adults or kind of old young adults to kind of middle age, unintentional injuries tend to be high, but here come cancer and heart attack, okay? You get into where probably your parents are going to fall in this range, and the unintentional injuries and homicide have gone way down, but it's pretty much cancer and heart disease that's killing people, and then if you make it through those years, the heart disease, um, and kind of cancer numbers, the heart disease numbers go up, the cancer numbers tend to go down just a little bit. Um, of the more deadly cancers are going to appear in this time on another topic that I like. Okay, so there's this shift, right? Young people, if you guys are going to die, you're not soon. You're not going to die from cancer or heart disease, more likely. This is what makes these diseases chronic. It takes them time to develop. It takes years and years and years and years and years for them to develop and to eventually become bad enough to kill you. There's good in it, right? Because that means we have lots of time to be able to intervene, right? We will talk about how we can change our physical activity. We'll talk about 
positive things that come from running or walking or biking or weight training or doing yoga or whatever it's going to be. We'll talk about those things. And I'll show you guys data that even if you've done nothing in your life up until now, or nothing until you're my age, okay? And then I will say your parents' age, although to be completely honest, some of y'all's parents are probably about my age. It would not have been too much of a scandal for, at this point for me to, uh, to, be, to be your parent, right? Done nothing into your life until you're my age. You can still start doing things and have vast improvements, okay? Really, really big, impactful improvements. And so because of the chronic nature of these things, you've got lots of time to make changes. You've got lots of time to do, to do these kind of positive things that are going to help us and are going to lower our risk of some of these things. Okay? Now, I will tell you guys that eventually father time or mother time comes for all of us. Um, but if we can be more active and we can be more fit, we can be healthier, and we can live longer, and we can actually do more things and enjoy more things that we want, while we're actually here, okay? So we'll talk about that. Okay, that's uh, probably enough for today, okay? On Canvas, there's a module called Assignments. On that module, there should be a Word document that says Assignment 1, Info Sheet. Please print this off, fill it out, bring it with you to class, on Wednesday. If you don't come to class on Wednesday, then fill it out and email it to me. Okay? You can print it and then you can scan it up on your phone if you want and email it that way or it's a Word document. You can just fill it out and email it back if for whatever reason you're not here on Wednesday. Okay? It asks you some get to know you questions. Where are you from? What do you want to do with yourself? Tell me something unique about yourself. And then it's going to ask, like, what kind of bro science questions would you like to answer? Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you for your attention. You guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Okay. We'll see you on Wednesday. Of course. Have a good one.